Hey guys, it's me Rob with Oakwood Machine Works, and I wanted to open up a series called Automating on a Budget because I just purchased an Epson VT6L, which is a six axis robot arm. It has about 900 millimeters of reach, six kilogram capacity. It's a pretty nice little robot for the money. I bought mine used for a very good price, however, new, they're still a very good price at about 14,500. When you compare it to like a UR5 or a UR10, it's you're looking at thirty-five to forty-five thousand for just the arm for the UR5 or the UR10, respectively. There are a lot of other peripheral costs, and they're not quite as easy to use, but that's something I'm willing to work with. The reason I'm even looking into this is I'm picking up a new series of parts. There's about eight part numbers each one having, some of the parts are only one op, some of them are two ops. But the primary thing that they'll be running, excuse the mess around the shop, these uh, extrusion profiles I'm cutting on, I'm gonna be making anywhere between 40 and 100 of these a week if they follow the current numbers of the part they will be replacing that I make, plus some additional. So the plan is to automate these extrusions. There's a top and a bottom. I'm going to focus on the top first. And the work holding is going to be a little tricky. I'm doing it on the fourth axis, obviously. And there's, I'm working on this face. There's a five degree angle. So there's another face, that face, and then this face as well. So I'm having to flip this thing all over the place. Luckily, I'm not having to work on the other side, but there's a lot to it, and it's a fairly long cycle. In fact, I'd say it's a bottleneck in the entire product line that I'll be making. Currently, I'm making these parts. I've been making them for about five years. It's been my bread and butter. The process has worked out really well. I'm doing them on a Pearson palette. I've made a hundred of them or so this week, and I'm just about to finish up the remainder of another hundred. I can knock them out very quickly. And then there's also a corresponding knob down here. I make a whole pile of those, again, on a Pearson palette. In about three days, I can meet my quota, and that leaves the machine open to do other things. I've been kind of thinking about getting another machine to run these new parts on, selling the mini mill and get replacing it with like a DT2 or something along those lines. But I'd end up in a similar position where I'm kind of the limiting factor of my equipment. Yes, I can keep both of these machines running, plus usually the Tormach all day, but I, I have to leave it the work at some point and it's not sustainable to be working incredibly long days. So I'm just trying to avoid that from the get go. So this good deal in the robot came along and I've been kind of working out some of the, just like workflow to begin with. So this is a messy flow chart I started working on, which by the way, if you have a, really any machine with glass, uh, just Sharpie on it and have a bottle of denatured alcohol. Works great and you can kind of think things out while you're making money. So you have the VF2, your main program, it might blow the part off run a chip fan, something like that. It'll run the M25, which is linked with the MFIN interface, which I'm still kind of trying to make heads and tails of that. Uh, from what I believe, it's basically program and robot come do your thing, and then basically an alternative cycle start. I just need to look, if, look and see if I need to configure any parameters for that. So it calls the M25, comes on down to the robot, which will then open the door, position the part. Th this is like a really rough outline, but it will open the door, position the part, uh, clamp the fixture. I'm going to be doing all the fixture control and checks from the robot itself. Uh, pull the robot out of the machine, close the door, and return to square one. And while all of this is happening up here, I also intend to have the robot doing the preparatory, preparatory work, so pick up the next part, uh, 
what is that, pick up the next part and just kind of ready itself at the machine doors and get ready. So as soon as the program ends, doors open back up and it'll load repeat, hopefully all night. But what that brings me to is there's a lot more to it than just setting the robot in front of here and saying, hey, go do all of this. There's coolant management, there's chip management, uh, making sure all of your air, like you meet the air demands. If you're using vacuum, making sure your vacuum demands are met. Just a ton of little things like that. Did a tool break? And are you going to crank out a whole bunch of scrap parts? There's a lot to it, and right off the bat, once I get it working, I mean, I'm going to keep it going on just while I'm here. If I go out to lunch, I'll stop it. And I'll just kind of feel things out for a while. And then I'll start moving into the actual high-volume production lights out. But it's like... Uh, if you're not familiar with the Haas coolant bins, this is what you have on the back of the machine. So what I have is my water line coming in. That's just straight water, no mixed in coolant. And I have a timer over there that I turn on. When I turn that on, there's also a solenoid valve that is normally closed. That opens. And I also have to open a manual valve that goes either to the Minimo or the VF2. And that will top this up and it's just timed on the amount of water that I want. So if I want a minute worth of water, I just turn it to a minute. Uh, I actually don't know what that correlates to as far as gallons, but I actually could work that out. And currently my plan is just, my job will be keeping an eye on those things manually and before I leave knowing what needs to be done. But longer term, I would like to automate that. But there are other things that are a lot harder to automate, like these little bins that collect your fines. Those will plug off, then this will start filling up with chips, and that can actually run coolant over the edge, which I have had happen. So there are going to have to be sensors feeding back to the robot for that. Uh, there's going to be a universal low air pressure emergency stop which I guess technically the Haas has so if you tie your e-stops together the robot shouldn't do anything the Haas shouldn't do anything we're just gonna sit here and wait for me to correct the issue and I'm not sure what the fault correction is on the robot arm as far as uh, like things error out you clear it how do you recover it from that so I may have to come up with some kind of routine for that. And the arm is coming with a little control pendant where you, it's basically a control panel for the robot. You do have to have it hooked up to a computer for programming, but you can set up a UI on that. So you could have this whole thing that you walk it through to recover. And as far as part feeding, I'm still trying to figure out how you grab from a grid. But I'm really just planning on having a stack of finish or a, st a stack of raw parts that you, there's a little thing that kicks one out. A sensor sees that it was kicked out and the, tells the robot, okay, you're good to come over and pick it up. Robot picks it up. Maybe the next one will feed out automatically. I don't know about that yet. There's a lot of li just little things that need to be done. I'm not even sure what it looks like on the back of the machine as far as the interfacing. I know it's under the main con board, which is kind of back in there. I tend to keep my fingers away from that stuff because I'm not an electrically inclined person. So there's all of that. Uh, lots to do. I'm not even sure how much of it I'll have done before the robot gets here, but I will, I will at least have it on the floor and have something to play with while learning and setting things up get it off to the side of the machine communicating with it and then one of the other big questions is do i want to feed it from the front because that will mess up the flow of my shop right now i just kind of walk over load the vf2 walk over load the mini mill then the tormach is right here it flows really well pretty well
there's a few little things I might change, but generally speaking, I can get through the shop and to each machine very effectively. So dropping a robot in front of this thing that I also have to move out of the way whenever I want to run it manually with Pearson pallets, uh, it's going to mess, mess the flow up a little bit. So I might end up putting it off on the right side here of the machine. Which, I mean, it's almost even easier to automate. You just stick, maybe make some kind of new crossbar for the side here. That can open up and close pneumatic cylinders. And a, could even just have a micro switch or something at the bottom. That tells it whether it's open or closed, an inductive switch probably. I kind of like that better. I'd have to do something different with like my tool area, but that might be the best method. I'm just not sure if I will be able to reach with the robot from here over to here. I know it has enough reach linearly, but just reaching over the tool setter and fourth axis, I'm not sure what that will yield me. I'd probably also need to do something about the air duct because that drips down and I'm not sure how resilient these arms are to the coolant. I know that they have some amount of resistance to it, but we'll see how that pans out. It could just be something as simple as putting an angled baffle in there. But yeah, lots to be thinking about. I'm really leaning towards putting it on the right side of the machine. But I also like being able to turn around from my desk and see everything happening in the shop. There's, there's a lot to be thinking about, but it's exciting. Uh, hopefully I get the invoice for the machine soon so I can actually purchase it. But I mean, the deal's basically done. I've confirmed what I need to confirm. I guess I can show you the software really quick. So this is the Epson RC7 Plus. It uses the Spell 7 language, which is an offshoot of BASIC if I didn't already say that. Uh, you have your input monitor, your labels, which I'm actually not sure how you define the name of these. I'm trying to figure that out right now, but if I hit start, it's kind of difficult to do one-handed. So right now, it's, go it's kind of in a waiting pattern. So if I toggle the status of pin zero... It's going to go to an idle position. It's going to grab a part. And then it's going to go to a waiting position, which would be like the machine doors would be right there. And then we're going to toggle this, which would be like the... M this is a machine telling the robot, hey, we're good to go. So it grabs it. It returns goes to a part, drop position, drops the part, goes to idle. It's really cool. Uh, I'm very, very excited to be diving into this. And it, let's say none of this pans out and it just wasn't right for me. I think I can, so, I'm very confident that I can sell the robot for what I have into it. And there's also the fact that I'm getting a really good education out of it. Like, even if I completely failed at machining, I've gotten an incredibly valuable education from having done all of this, so just having that additional being able to program industrial robots, not universal robots, but, like, actually punching in machine code, uh, it's, it's a good thing to have under my belt, I think, but I have no plans on closing shops, so... All right, so I will try to keep you guys updated and produce some content based on all of these little solutions and how I'm managing it. I will see you guys in future installments.